Jean, I have two questions for you. Uh, first is a rumor that is going around regarding the major research instrumentation program. We have heard a little rumbling that a new solicitation may be issued this year with a deadline in this year as opposed to January of 2023. My second question very quickly is regarding um, RCR training. NIH has required a uh, in-person component uh, four, of, four hours out of the eight. And I was wondering if you are anticipating NSF may be issuing a similar requirement in the future. Well, I, the, the first one is easy. I can't really talk about um, uh, whether uh, a, an upcoming solicitation will be posted. Um, I can certainly um, get uh, information uh, from Dr. Randy Phelps who runs that program in terms of timing, but right now I don't have specific timing to provide to you. So I apologize for that. Oh, okay. But, oh, but great. can Thanks. look into that. The other item I can absolutely address. Okay. So um, actually um, when NSF originally implemented it, now it's responsible and it used to be RCR, responsible conduct of research. Now it's responsible and ethical conduct of research. And <clears throat> NSF gave the flexibility of to the institution to determine the medium that you would use to conduct the training. Obviously, um, we know for a fact that, uh, and research has indicated that those that are more engaging, um, meaning in person, uh, uh, have some better results. But the bottom line is, uh, NIH is for their fellowship and training programs. Um, NSFs is for everything. So that means any undergrad, grad student, or postdoc supported by NSF to conduct research must have training in the responsible and ethical conduct of research. And I will tell you one thing I can tell you for certain is that um, the CHIPS Plus Science Act. Uh, actually expanded that to faculty members. So more to come in the future okay. on that. We only encourage that in the PAP guide. So at the present time, we are considering and have no immediate plans to change the medium of which you have to change, meaning you have to do these in person. Um, they, for example, would apply to an REU student because they are supported by NSF and undergrad supported by NSF to conduct research. Um, and you only have them for a few weeks in the summer. So uh, many institutions based on what kind of student and what, what level student, you know, the way you would train an undergrad is very different the way you would train postdocs and certainly in the future faculty. So for right now, we, are, we have made no change. And NIH actually changed that a few years ago, but um, NSF has not made a similar change and has at, actually at the present time, you always have to say that in policy land, at the present time, we have no change, no plans to change that. Hi, Jean. Uh, thank you for spending your morning with us. Uh, I have a question regarding the concept outline you mentioned earlier. And uh, is this an SF's version of white paper? That's the um, first question. Uh, first of all, white paper, even the term white paper differs from agency to agency. So it's very hard to, um, to, uh, to articulate that. Some of, uh, some white papers have just a description of the science, a shorter description of the science. These concept outlines are actually even shorter than that. They really are just, okay, they want to do a planning proposal. Is this appropriate for a planning proposal? Or does this um, funding opportunity that's requiring uh, the concept outline, um, is this a, a, an appropriate area uh, or, or science area to get to. So, I mean, we are, our, our, the narrative is actually very, a, a brief narrative description of the idea. Um, and then some um, other important information like the title keywords um, and uh, who the prospective PIs are. So um, I will not say 
it's not a white paper because it's NSF's own thing. So now we have, we'll have LOIs, letters of intent, that help us, very, very brief, that really are there to help us. They are not reviewed at all. They are informational for NSF to manage, uh, help us manage the review process and understand uh, the number of proposals coming in. We have this new concept outline that really is to save time for the prospective PIs by saying, here's the basic idea. Is it, give me um, the necessary, um, what, and they will get a, uh, an email back from the program officer um, saying that it's acceptable to submit. So that's saving the administrative burden. Preliminary proposals are shortened versions of proposals and vary by uh, funding off program solicitation. And then obviously there are full proposals. So those, these are really NSF centric. I don't wanna, cause I know, I know other agencies, DOD uses that terminology, sometimes NASA and how they use them and what's in them can be very different from agency to agency. So I hope that's helpful to you. Okay, yes, thank you. Uh, so you mentioned that these concept outlines should be submitted through the prospect web portal or tool. Well, tool. well they could, it's either or, um, email or the prospect tool and the funding opportunity will tell you um, what you um, could be using for planning rapid eager raise, it gives you the option. Okay, so, will, uh, will this function ever be rolled into research.gov? Um, sure, I mean, I, I'm not, we, it is not on the current plan right now, but obviously, um, you know, I, it, it, it would be too soon to, to make an, a definitive answer, but it is a possibility but it hasn't been discussed yet. So it's probably best for me not to answer that question. Okay, so that one last question about this subject is, uh, how long should we expect a turnaround if we send in a concept outline? Well, that's gonna vary, obviously. Um, uh, if we have, for example, and let me tell you why that it, it makes a difference. If, for example, we had, you're responding to just, uh, it's an unsolicited proposal, you're doing a, uh, you intend to submit a planning proposal uh, to NSF, and so you have to submit a concept outline. Well, that's a one-by-one -one activity. However, if you have a funding opportunity or someone has a dear colleague letter where they're asking for rapid awards, well, they could be getting a whole lot of submissions then. And so the time may be greater when it is a requirement of a funding opportunity or a DCL, because then they may be getting a whole bunch of uh, concept outlines that they have to look at at one time. A great example of why we actually moved to this process was COVID. Um, we told uh, folks to come in with their ideas um, in a DCL and we just got absolutely slammed and had no capability to track them or for the PI to see where they were in the process. And so what this does is just provides a more formalized process for you to submit the outline, know where it stands in the system and pump out the necessary documentation that you will have to upload in the full proposal to submit it to NSF. Hi, Jean, I appreciate you and your time with us this morning. You, you briefly mentioned BAM, um, and I was wondering if there will be an opportunity for community feedback on that system, as I anticipate, there will be some heartache as it is a very different setup from what we're used to. Yeah, I mean, here, let me tell you that, first of all, BAM is not heavily used at all right now. There are only a few, very few BAAs um, out uh, and, and the research innovation engines is one of those. And so what we did was develop a very bare bones and yes, 
We know you will have comments, but with the idea that ultimately, and this is one I can tell you, will be ultimately taken over and um, become a functionality um, that's included in research.gov. So eventually the BAM system itself will go away, um, but BAAs in general, the challenge is they are for folks that aren't used to doing business with NSF, um, many for-profit organizations. Oh my heavens, the, the number of questions on eligibility we have gotten for research innovation engines that went into you know, submission of these um, concept outlines was huge. So there will be always opportunities in the future for you to communicate with NSF about what you've seen and what you've experienced. And so, um, but we, we do have the idea that with the, the BAM that you see right now will look very different ultimately in the future. This was just a bare bones version to get out on the street to permit um, things like the research and innovation engines to come in the door.